The biggest names in sports are all on IsraelSportsRadio.com. All right, we're back here on the Andy and Ari Show on IsraelSportsRadio.com. Our next guest is a amazing filmmaker. He's doing a documentary about a boxer from Cuba. He is a champion, and it's my pleasure, and Israel Sports Radio's pleasure to introduce to you Bryn Jonathan Butler. How are you doing out there? so much for having me on. Our pleasure. We had so much fun the last time you were on. We had to obviously follow up. Now, uh, your fighter uh, had a great fight Saturday night. Uh, please tell the audience uh, what happened. I understand he was uh, not uh, predicted to do as well as he did and did fantastic with the first-round knockout. So uh, tell us what happened over there. Well, it, it was a pretty remarkable performance. Yeah, he, he knocked him down three times. Willie Casey, Willie Big Bang Casey, uh, right in his backyard in Dublin. Casey's actually from Limerick, and uh, yeah, he just he did everything he needed to do, I think, to get back uh, in step with with fighting again in America and and you know getting on top of the game. All right, now this was for the 130 pound title. This was for the 122 pound title. Uh, no, Junior featherweight. Junior featherweight. Okay. So, first defense of the championship. Now, uh, we spoke a little before the interview. You discussed the fact that he was a 10-to-1 underdog. What, what was that all about? Well, no. <laughs> well, one of the odd things that happened while I was there is uh, Rigg Al's opponent apparently had some ties to uh, criminal elements from rumors that I heard. Right. And there was a theft at the, the hotel where Rigg and Al and, and my film crew were staying. And the rumor was that they were trying to steal Regan Diaz's championship belt two days before the fight to sort of throw him off his game. And what they ended up doing was stealing my camera and about 45% of my footage from the main camera I was using to film the dog. Wow. So they just pulled up in a van as we were getting into a van and, and literally, literally just, just yanked <laughs> the camera bag. Um, so... After that, basically, I kind of took an odd step by, you know, we were at the last legs of our budget for the documentary. We had to cover this cameraman for his $5,000 camera. So I went next door to the betting shop and found out the odds on the fight and put everything that we had left on him winning in the first round. Oh, my goodness. Wow, you're talking about a roll of the dice. So it was 10 to 1 for him to win in the first round. It was 20 to 1 for him to win in the first round. So I put some money in that, and I put the rest on 6 to 1 for him to win before the fourth. And then I went back to Rigo's hotel room and asked him how probable it was that he could win early. And he thought I was crazy, but as soon as he knocked the guy out, the first thing he did is he came over to the ropes where I jumped into the ring to hug him and said, You owe me. I did this so you could make your movie. Wow. So he knew about this before the fight. He knew he had to get a knockout early. He had to get it in the first round. It was the best possible scenario, and, and we literally had nothing left in the film budget. I called up my producer and said, I don't know why I'm thinking about this. I've never gambled in my life. Do you want to do it? And the producer said, what do we have left? you got to do it. So that's what we did, and it just it just worked out. Now, is this so, part... Will this part be in the documentary, the part where you had to bet on your fighter to continue the documentary? I, it absolutely is, because I had a dream two days before it happened, before I laid the bet, that he knocked him out in the first round, that I gambled on it, which is a weird dream, because as I say, I don't gamble. So I've got footage of myself in front of the betting shop saying just that, and, yeah, filming the tickets and, and dealing with the aftermath of having our camera stolen. I mean, I'm not used to a coordinated theft of my property, um, let alone from the opponent of this boxer I've been following for this doc. So it was very unusual circumstances. Now, but have you been in touch worked. with the authorities about all this, about your camera being stolen? Well, we did. We did get in touch with the authorities, and the hotel staff was the one who told us most likely it was Rigo's opponent. So I don't have that substantiated anywhere, but that was the, the consensus of the, the rumor mill was that you know, it was a pretty dodgy scene in Ireland. I mean, we were training in Cork leading up to the fight, and then we moved over to Dublin. And, I mean, the the, the driver and, and some of the staff who was looking after Rigo's team, they told us we were lucky we weren't stabbed, as well as 
having our property stolen. So I, it was a pretty strange setting for a championship fight. The guy wins a championship and he has to fight in his opponent's backyard. Right. So uh, the 122 mile champion. Uh, talk about the crowd there in Ireland. What was that like for the fight? We were told that the engine would be running outside the stadium because they were terrified that a mob would happen after the weigh-in. They wouldn't eat at the hotel because they were afraid of food poisoning for Rigo. It was a very scary scene. Uh, We were told that the gypsy population of Limerick emptied because they moved all over to Dublin to be in attendance for the fight. And I I was at Rigo's last fight in Dallas. There was 42,000 people. And to my ears, it was louder with 4,200 Irishmen. Um, at that, that Dublin Convention Center. I, they were just a crazy bunch of people, but in the end, they were very respectful. There, there, I, I think there was violence after, but it wasn't directed towards us, and we were pretty sure there was going to be something really difficult to deal with, and and it, it, it just worked out really well. It worked out really, really well. And I imagine most of the 4,200 are obviously not rooting for Rigo to win, I, I assume. I saw, I saw one Cuban. I saw one Cuban out of 4,200, and actually when Rigo won, there's a great picture where he leans over the ropes and holds up his arms in victory, and every single woman who's in attendance is sticking up their middle finger at him. And it turned out his opponent had literally 22 siblings. Wow. So all of these people were deposited right in that section of the crowd where Rigo is celebrating, and you could just see the look of just disgust on their faces after he's knocked out their their guy, so it, it was a crazy scene. Now, I haven't seen anything quite like it. Now, you mentioned after Rigo's victory when he was on the undercard of that big Manny Paco fight in uh, Cowboy Stadium in Texas that he yeah. seemed so what, lack of days ago, is kind of like he won the belt and the belt was bigger than him and he was riding in the back of the car and it was kind of like sort of whatever to him. Was this victory a little more different partly because of the what was on the line that he had to continue to, to the for the documentary sake he had to win and win in the first round? Uh, yeah, I think it absolutely was. I think everybody around him really did everything they could to to get it across. You know, Rigo quite commonly would say to me, "I'm going to take my time." You know, I know everybody wants me to fight a certain way, but I'm going to take my time. And my response to him was, "You're almost 31 years old. I mean, there, there isn't time." which is scary. I mean, there's just incredible pressure on this guy and from, from every corner. And so I think he really did understand it in, in Ireland, and especially with the crowd that was going to really pump up their guy more and more and more throughout the fight, that he had to win spectacularly. And in America, it's not just winning the way as it is in Cuba. You have, it's, it's how you win that's really going to make the statement. And Rigo's only hope, in terms of bringing his family over or really supporting himself, is he, he has to impress and really connect to the fans. And that's what was missing in Dallas, is the, the one thing that I saw that made it really sad was there's no gratitude on his face, because gratitude implies you have to connect to somebody. And he, he doesn't have anybody that he feels he can connect to or really trust. But this looked a little different to me. I felt a lot better about things after seeing just the response to him winning. I think he gets it, and, and that's very important. Well, sure. I mean, you take a look. Uh, I always think about George Foreman, you know, powerful champion in the 70s, but never really connected, didn't have the fan base. Uh, 20 years later, puts on 50 pounds, but he's smiling, and that caused him to make uh, millions of dollars with his grill. So boxers and, and athletes in general eventually learn you have to have a little more of a cheery upside, even in a violent sport. Like boxing, so he wins. Uh, excuse me, he retains the 122 pound title. Are there any new fights on the horizon? I know the 122 pound division; it's a talented division, but it's not the sexiest division. It's not the 147, 154. So, what's uh, in the future plans of Rigo? Well, 